set. Mike's working. All right, I'm Dan Balduri. I'm the acting director of PetSwap. So I get to sit here next to Roger. Um, our uh, speaker today, to our great good fortune, is uh, Professor Roger Salvo, who's uh, Professor Emeritus in the uh, Sociology Department here at Fitz. Um, Roger, Roger, it seems to me, knows something about everything. It's amazing, it's amazing to me. Um, I, I was giving a little talk at, at a sociology seminar, and I mentioned that uh, the Lesotho Liberation Army was an important recruiting uh, organization for the rise of the National Union of Mine Workers. Next day, I get a paper on the Lesotho Liberation Army that Roger wrote probably six, seven, eight, maybe more years before. Um, Nobody else even knew who they were. <laughs> so, I'm sure that Roger will have lots to say uh, that will be extremely interesting. He's going to be speaking about uh, the ANC and the new black middle class. Uh, right, I will do. Oh, and, oh, I should say, the new edition of the New South African Review is just out, and there are copies out there if you want to uh, acquire one. <coughs> How do I work with technology? Was it on? You did. That's all. Yes, yes, it should be ready. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, right. Black middle class. Um, first thing I will say is that it's a subject I've been starting investigating for the last couple of years. And I will say it is, I have never found a topic about which people are so opinionated. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, when you send stuff off to journals, the sort of comments you get. Um, often extremely ignorant, but anyway, everybody seems to be interested in it. And it seems to be happening globally as well. Um, you are probably... There we are. You're probably aware of the Africa rising hype which goes on around the world in various, various quarters about the way in which uh, when the West was plunged into recession in 2008, Africa was seen as the one great rising uh, and hopeful area in the world. Economic growth was higher than, than anywhere else. There was a new commercial vibrancy, etc., etc., And uh, the rate of investment was generally seen to be higher in Africa than elsewhere. Uh, amidst all this excitement, there was a lot of concentration on the development of what was termed the fastest growing middle class in the world, uh, African Development Bank, and so it claimed something like 34% of the African population uh, was middle class. Things get even better than that because apart from being seen as drivers of development, the black middle, sorry, the, the African middle class is always also seen as drivers of democracy. Uh, they're seen as increasingly collected by new social media. They are seen as uh, enlightened voters who are increasingly demanding uh, greater accountability from politicians, and so on and so forth. So, then we get to this sort of quote, which is fairly representative of the sort of things you can pick up off the internet. It's generally held in democratic theory that a burgeoning middle class indicates a blossoming society, and that a powerful middle class which is collectively wealthier than the elite and more numerous than the poor invariably leads to a healthy, functional, and truly democratic society, which is both accountable and responsive to the needs of its citizens, and centered upon ensuring the welfare of all its citizens, which often results in greater economic growth. To be fair, some qualifications are entered about the, this new middle class being fairly precarious and so on. However, having said that, most such, I think we need to uh, recognize that most such analysis tends to emanate from the world of finance, and therefore I think we need to uh, uh, give it a, something of a substantial critique. I don't think we need necessarily so frontally, frontally disagree with it, but we certainly need to uh, certainly investigate and question the trope of the progressive nature of the African middle class. 
I think we need to complicate it. Certainly there are other writers, more critical writers, who are arguing that if we rely on a class which, as much of this literature suggests, is increasingly consumerist, then it's not so automatically clear that it will, or that it will necessarily support progressive political causes. The reflections about the African middle class in general I think repeat a lot of classic debates in social science going back for many years. In fact, if we go back to uh, Aristotle, in fact, he was in many ways the most proponent of a middle class in a good society. I think in modern times, much of the uh, debate about the uh, middle class comes from Seymour Martin Lipset, who actually, if you go back to that rather famous book he wrote, uh, he starts off uh, with a a preface around Aristotle, and he was arguing that if you increase wealth and education and urbanization and so on within a society, then you bring about a, uh, uh, you, you, you reduce the people in those society, you reduce their commitment to extreme ideologies. And his work stimulated a whole spawn of later work trying to work out the relationships between democracy and development. But I think there's also been a, another tradition, I think, which uh, highlighted by the work of uh, Barrington Moore, the fa uh, famous book on social origins, dictatorship and democracy, when to uh, simplify his thesis, a 500 page book, um, I think he said the emergence of a bourgeoisie was a necessary condition for a democracy, but not a sufficient one. And I think his work has gone on to provide an inspiration for major studies of democratization in the global south, with uh, uh, Ruchmeyer and his colleagues uh, coming up in the early, uh, sorry, Barrington Moore wasn't 1996, of course, he's writing in the 1960s. Ruchmeyer fell writing in the uh, early 1990s talking about the political role of the middle classes being shaped historically by particular associations and involving them in all sorts of different class alliances, whether with elites, working classes, or peasantries, according to that particular situation. So I think the, the two traditions about the middle class uh, overlap, uh, but I think the, the latter, uh, Barrington Moore plus uh, tradition, leans more strongly in the direction of the lower classes and their demands for equality as the most significant actors in the making and consolidation of democracy. I think we can relate generally these broader debates about the middle class to contemporary South Africa. But it's not it's not complete, it's not straightforward as I don't think there has been uh, at, at the present time. I don't think there is anything serious uh, uh, seriously what we can call a debate. So what I'm, what I'm going to do here is to uh, suggest three propositions uh, about the black middle class, by which I'm talking incidentally in this context about the specific African middle class in South Africa. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, three propositions. And the first is that uh, emanating from, I think, both historical and liberation movement literature, there's the familiar argument that uh, the development of the black middle class was stunted by the state under segregation and apartheid, and in consequence it threw in its lot with the working class under the leadership of the ANC. The second proposition is that in essence the black middle class is tied to the apron strings of the ANC, and in other words its growth uh, security and prospects of the black middle class are a product of its historical attachment to the party, as well as to post-1994 policies of affirmative action and black economic empowerment and so forth. And then there's the third proposition that the growth of, and this really is following the Lipset tradition, following the proposition, uh, following, uh, which is suggesting that the steady growth of the black middle class is generally a good thing, and that it will con contribute to the consolidation of democracy and greater political diversity. 
and from that far as much of the stuff we got in the recent election about with the black little class vote, the DA or Hagan or, or whatever. I'm going to now just elaborate a little bit on these three <coughs> propositions, but only after a brief note about actually trying to work out what we're talking about. There's a lot of stuff which comes out in the media about what the black middle class is, and this goes over into the academic literature, particularly coming from economists. And I am beginning to um, divide the ways in which the black middle class is conceived into what I term consumptionist and productionist perspectives. A lot of the, in fact, most of the stuff you see in the media, I think, really comes from the consumptionist direction. And it's particularly prominent, it's been made most famous, some would say notorious, in the Black Diamonds literature from the UCT Unilever Institute. It's been backed up with a, a, a well cited paper by Visagium and Posen, uh, both economists. Basically, the consumptionist approaches uh, argue that, uh, they, they, that they give us a lot of valuable information about growth of uh, middle income groups and living standards and spending power and lifestyles and so on. Um, but I think largely they are descriptive um, and they're simply telling us what people do without being backed, I think, by any great um, theoretical uh, apparatus. I think in contrast, if we take something of a productionist approach, it helps us to explain the dynamics of class behavior because it's based on the notion that income and occupation, consumption and affluence are outcomes of some combination of work, occupation, education and wealth. And uh, I, I start off in trying to think about the black middle class with the book by uh, Jeremy Seekings and Nicolene Actress in 2006, where at a very considerable length, uh, a couple of chapters, they, they deal with the South African class system. They, I haven't got a diagram here, but they give us a triangular three-tiered class system. Um, it's ranging upward from a large very large marginalized working class through a narrowing tier in the middle to a very, very small upper class. Within each tier, there, there are subcategories of class, informal and casual workers, um, alongside impoverished uh, and generally dependent underclass at the bottom, semi-professionals such as teachers and nurses alongside white collar workers and formerly employed workers in the middle and so on, managers, professionals, and the independently rich at the top, and so on and so forth. Um, within this overall context, they lo locate a new African elite as beginning to penetrate the upper class, and so on. Now there's controversies about their particular formulation, particularly in the way in which they throw in the formerly employed working class into their middle, middle tier, but I'm not going to deal with that for the moment. Um, the, but on the other hand, clearly their approach is broadly Weberian, but they also bring in neo-Marxist theorizing because they refer to Eric Erwin Wright, and they try to relate the different categories and subcategories of class to the exercise of workplace authority, which I also think, also think is important. However, my major criticism, which I think they need to be supplemented with, is that they are simply relating class, broadly speaking, to the economy. And uh, elsewhere, I've outlined um, how, basing itself upon its political hegemony, the ANC has increasingly sought to bring public institutions, which are decreed to be politically independent under the Constitution, into what I term a party state. And the way in which the accession to power has made the uh, ANC the major fount of opportunity uh, for both employment and access to resources for a black majority. And, it's the fact it's the party state which has become the fulcrum around which much op upward social mobility has revolved and chances for private accumulation and so on. 
Uh, and in fact, this reaches over into the private sector because, of course, you get a lot of political leverage to be able to enter the private sector as well. So that's very brief, and that's a very, a very compressed mention of what is a very complicated debate. Let us look at the three propositions. The, it is basically that the black middle class is regarded as a progressive force in the struggle for democracy in our alliance with the working class under the leadership of the ANC, and this is formalized in the theorization of the National Democratic Revolution. I think everybody will, familiar, will, be, everybody will be familiar with the historical underpinnings of the black middle class uh, in terms of its creation in initial creation in mission schools and so forth in the late 19th century, the way in which it played the leading role in forming the ANC in 19, 1912, and so on. And then much of, the is, uh, it, much of the literature is arguing that the middle class continued to play the major role within the ANC during the uh, interwar years, 